Thank you very much. It's, it's certainly a pleasure to be attending this, this great meeting. And so many different perspectives weighing on this uh, important revolution in, in, in the life sciences. Um, as you can see from my slide, I have, have two professional roles. Yes, I'm a professor at the University of Minnesota. And I'm going to tell you today about work we're doing more recently there to improve gene editing in plants, make it more efficient, make it more robust. But about 10 years ago, I founded a company called Calix shortly after uh, my group and Adam Bogdanov's group had, had created the first talons. So we knew that talons were a powerful reagent allowing us to target plant genes very specifically. And, and there were clearly many applications in, in agriculture. Um, and you know, when we set up the company, it was mostly just about trying to get the technology to work. But then as that happened, um, we started to think about what kind of tech, what kind of company we wanted to create. So Calix uses the technology to improve food, to make healthier food ingredients. Um, and over the, one of our first products is a, is a soybean oil that's healthier for you. We changed the fatty acid composition so that it's more like olive oil or sunflower oil, and you can fry three times as longer and less oil adheres, so you, you consume fewer calories. Um, and so it's been a fun and interesting process in parallel to my academic life. Um, and we also met with you know, Neil's group at, at the USDA to get regulatory clearance to plant those soybeans out in the field you know, already several years ago. Um, just this year, um, we've completed a consultation with the FDA um, who assessed our product as a food ingredient for humans and animals. Um, and this past year, uh, we harvested, well, we planted uh, contracted to plant 50,000 acres and sold the first gene edited food ingredient. So that was a, a fun and rewarding aspect of this journey along the, the gene editing uh, path. So that soybean plant had a knockout in two genes. So biallelic knockout in two genes to change the fatty acid composition. So that's really, I think, uh, CRISPR 1.0, right? That's a pretty simple, straightforward genetic modification. Um, but we, if we really want to capitalize on this technology, um, carry out the, the types of uh, genetic changes that Zach told us about, we really need to accelerate the way that we create gene-edited plants. And, and this was really recognized shortly after you know, CRISPRs were first implemented in plants. Uh, this is a slide from, well, the NSF convened a group of plant scientists and said, okay, this powerful technology is now in, in hand. Let's use it, well, you know, how do we use it to its full potential? And um, the conclusion was that there's still bottlenecks into its implementation. Um, first of all, we have, if we want to utilize all this knowledge that we've gained, NSF is invested in genome sequences and we have, you know, the transcript profiles and metabolic profiles. We have a lot of knowledge that's generated hypotheses about how plants work and function and how this and how this information can be used for food, feed, and fiber. But getting from here to here, we have to go through these bottlenecks. And one of these bottlenecks is uh, the delivery of reagents into plant cells and the regeneration of, of edited plants. We don't have any simple unified protocols for this process. So this is the way plants, transgenic plants are made, and now gene-edited plants are made. And Fyodor was talking about the telephone of 30 years ago. Um, actually, this has not changed in 30 years. We're still doing the exact same. Uh, we're still creating genetically modified plants the exact same way. So we take some plant tissue. It can be a leaf or an immature embryo, put it on a Petri dish. We infect it with agrobacterium, a soil bacterium that delivers DNA to those cells, or we just literally blast the DNA into the tissue. And so some of these cells become transgenic, and we can propagate these. Um, they'll divide into an undifferentiated mass of tissue, and then we add hormones to induce shoots and roots and ultimately a plant. So in soybean, this can take six to nine months from initial tissue to edited or transgenic plant. Um, and I can't do this with every soybean variety. There's maybe two of the thousands of soybean varieties that have been developed over the years. And so it's very genotype dependent. Um, and so, you know, I came back from this meeting um, 
which sort of defined these bottlenecks. And I just had a few new graduate students who joined the lab, and they were smart and, and eager and naive. <laughs> so I said, you know, we don't want to do this anymore, right? Come up with a brand new way um, so that we can create gene-edited plants without, without tissue culture. <clears throat> And so uh, the story I'm going to tell you is the story of two of those students, Michael and Ryan. Um, it's just, it'll be published uh, next Monday in Nature Biotech. And, and they just kind of thought outside of the box a little bit and came up with a new approach, a, an approach that uses developmental regulators, uh, genes that pr promote um, changes in, in developmental state uh, to achieve more efficient gene editing. So I need to introduce you to the Meristem. Uh, this is a a, stem, a group of stem, a stem cell niche, if you will, at the apex of the plant and at the side nodes of the plant. Um, and the meristem uh, divides and responds to a number of external and, and plant-derived uh, signals, and it divides to produce the, seed, or the leaves, the flowers, and, and the seeds. So it's clearly a stem cell niche. Um, and uh, what we reasoned is that if you could modify uh, this stem cell niche, um, you might be able to modify the shoots that are, that are derived from the plant. And so this is sort of another view of the meristem, a cartoon view of the meristem. Again, these stem cells here, they respond to some of the factors that Zach mentioned, Clavata 3. Wuschel is a transcription factor that, that uh, maintains the, the stem, stem state, if you will, of these cells. It also the, responds to plant hormones like cytokinins. And others had shown that if you ectopically express some of these factors, you can induce little growths or shoot-like structures. And so uh, what my, my students, the hypothesis was, is that we can deliver some of these, co these developmental regulators along with gene editing reagents. Maybe we can convert um, a plant cell into this meristem and produce a shoot that produces edited seed, OK? So this is Ryan's approach. He uh, started off with, it was seeds that he put into a petri dish and germinated them. And then he'd add agrobacterium, again that's our favorite agent for delivering genes into plant cells. He'd add uh, agrobacterium strains that had gene editing reagents and these developmental regulators. And he'd, the seedlings would um, grow and some of them were transformed and they'd form these callus-like growths, and then ultimately some of those callus-like growths would produce new shoots and plants. So um, for those of you who work in vertebrate systems, it, this is sort of like you know, taking your arm and throwing in some Yamanaka factors and inducing one of those skin cells into not a pluripotent state, but in plants they're totipotent. You can actually recreate all tissues from any somatic cell, and that's, that's what's happening here. So, um, so um, this is just a diagram of a few of the constructs that were delivered um, in initial experiments. So we had a luciferase porter looking at this top construct, and we did not know which developmental regulators were going to promote shoot induction. So we tried you know, different combinations of them. This happens to be a weak promoter and a strong promoter. So uh, the seedling approach was really conducive to kind of defining what would induce the shoot. And this is just an example of what I showed in the cartoon previously. Here we have a seedling in a petri dish. The luciferase reporter indicates that we're getting uh, genetic information into the cells of the, of, of the seedling. And then these are some of the growths that form uh, leaf-like structures. And then ultimately, this is basically what I showed in the cartoon, you get these little shoots on um, on the, the leaves of the newly emerged seedling. And then we can excise these and put them into auger, and then they will induce, ultimately induce, um, or roots and, and, and full, create full plants. So this is just an example of one of his experiments. So the, the y-axis is the, the count, if you will. So he's not using many seedlings, you know, 20 to 40 or so seedlings. And then certain combinations, he could see how many full plants he could recover. So 30-ish seedlings, and he's getting about 10-ish or so plants with some of these combinations. So it, it turned out to be, certain combinations turned out to be quite uh, efficient. So then he added Cas9, 
with his favorite combination, Cas9 and a guide RNA, these guides are targeting a gene involved in carotenoid biosynthesis. So if you inactivate it, um, the plant cells become white. So we could hopefully monitor um, induction of, of edited shoots. And so early on, you know, this is one of those growths that has not yet formed a shoot. He, of course, was excited, harvested it, and tested it to see if there was editing taking place in this <clears throat> tissue. And indeed, um, well, this is just NGS sequencing of this particular sample, you know, high frequencies of editing at, at his intended target. And then these shoots would go on to create plants, as I mentioned, and then he would harvest somatic cell, subject, so somatic cells, sub, make DNA and subject it to next generation sequencing, and you could see it's chimeric. This is the frequency of reads that have mutations in each of these different plants. And then if you let these plants go to seed, you can see segregation of the phenotype. This is a completely white seedling. Um, there's two targets here. So this is a biallelic mutation, two gene targets. Um, and indeed, he was able to show that he in inactivated that gene to create um, that phenotype. And now we're expanding it to other plant species. We've got it to work in, in tomato, this particular approach of growing seedlings. And, um, we're getting both transgenic and gene edited tomato. This is some of the earlier experiments. And so hopefully we can move this out of our, our model plant uh, into other plant species and, and do some of the, the cool modifications um, in species like tomato that Zach was telling us about. Okay, Michael, the other student, didn't w he, he didn't want to do anything that involved a Petri dish or sterile technique. <laughs> so he simply grew plants in soil and then removed the apical meristems and the meristems at the nodes, and then introduced his re reagents directly onto these whole plants. And so his reasoning was is that these are already, you know, if you just let this plant grow, it will create shoots at that site. It's pre-programmed to do so. Um, and he was hoping that he could induce some shoots that would have edits that would transmit those edits uh, to the next generation. So <clears throat> again, he uh, started off with a luciferase reporter in different combinations of those developmental regulators. Um, and, excuse me, and this is some of what he saw in some of those initial experiments. So here's the cut site, and you can start to see sh um, shoots emerge. Now, some of the shoots were luciferase positive and transgenic, and you can see the, the leaves are distorted and perturbed. So he would create transgenic shoots, but because those developmental regulators were constitutively expressed, it often uh, led to this perturbed uh, morphology. But after a period of time, well, well, after he was able to show that he could induce shoots by this approach that were transgenic, he then added his gene editing reagents and repeated the experiments. And now you see these little shoots emerging from the plant, and in this case, you know, they're white or white sectored, and if you harvest this tissue and analyze it, it indeed has uh, biallelic knockout mutations in, in his target gene. And um, this is one of our, our favorite shoots that emerged. It's clearly chimeric. There's white tissue, as you can see these white leaves, and then this nice white stripe here that gave rise to the seed pod. Um, it was hard, we regretted this reporter because we would create white shoots that never gave rise to seed because they were photosynthetically uh, incompetent. But this one was surrounded by green tissue so that the seed matured and 100% of the seed links were white and had a fixed biallelic mutation. Now the surrounding green tissue also gave rise um, to seed and that had different complement mutations. So in here one we had a biallelic in, in one of the PDS genes and the other one was a heterozygous, so we saw a three to one segregation uh, in the next generation. So um, this is you know, another example of you know, one of our favorite plants. Here we have two shoots that we've induced. This one is transgenic. It's, we created the biallelic knockout mutation, but we also have that perturbed uh, morphology. Um, this is a, a normal shoot um, that emerged from that plant. Um, and again, we've been able to um, use use this approach in other species. Um, this is an example of potato. Uh, we've generated uh, transgenic shoots in potato. We've also done it um, in grape. But um, mm -hmm. 
the next step is to really you know, refine the technology. Uh, we can know we can induce these edited shoots. You know, can we limit the expression of the regulators or excise the regulators so we don't get these transgenic phenotypes? Um, and can we continue to expand it outside of our model plant um, into other plants of agricultural uh, relevance? So that's the goal um, in, in the coming years. And we're, hopefully that, we're hopeful that this will help at least loosen that bottleneck a little bit better so that we can more quickly generate um, gene edited plants and more complex gene edits in plants using these types of technologies. So uh, here's Michael, the guy who hates sterile technique, and here's Ryan who started off with the, the seedling approach. So thanks, happy to answer any questions.